Welcome back. I'm Ann Marsuffer from English, and I am honored and delighted to introduce Rita Raley. Among all the varied and good efforts at this conference so far to remind us that the digital and all its articulations should not and cannot constitute a big, smooth, shiny, void monolith, among all that, Rita Rayleigh offers a particular reminder that one cannot be alone amongst the multiple beings. She uses those words as the opening epigraph to a recent essay, Living Letter Forms, and the epigraph comes from Jabe, the artist whose work is one focus of that essay. And she shapes the end of that essay with resolute words about relationality, about learning to inhabit worlds together. Professor Rayleigh's texts encourage us to acknowledge the possibilities of relationality as she catalogs and makes very clear the nimble and very real risks so many take in using aesthetics for making beautiful and political trouble. Professor Rayleigh reminds us of what is possible when we resist the demand to demand, when that is we take seriously the practices of relationality. She argues for the situation of the ephemeral, the intermedial, the self-terminating, the proliferating, the disintegrating, the vulnerable, the tactile, and of course, the tactical. She argues it might be possible to say, I think, for all that resists a desire, even a negative desire, for monolith. For all of that, we thank you, and we welcome you. quite a lot with my talk today. So let me first start, of course, by thanking Richard and Mary, who um, has been a great help in the organization of, of um, the conference as a whole, but my being here in particular. So I agree very much with Lisa Nakamura's statement yesterday that it's almost as if this conference should have happened a decade ago, or we wish it had happened a decade ago. But nonetheless, it's thrilling that it's happening now. And I very much enjoyed the presentation so far. Sorry to have missed um, in the going back and forth some of the uh, others throughout the day. Um, but I look forward to conversations tonight and tomorrow as well. So I've chosen this image for the start because I just want to get MOOC out of the way. So MOOC, 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 right? It's a taboo word. And I do want to stress that the talk that I'm going to deliver is about more than just the MOOC. Courseware is the term that I'm using. Um, E-learning is a term that Susan Gwerlach uses. There are other ways to think about this, but um, we might uh, consider the ways in which MOOCs in particular are being resisted by faculty, San Jose State, Amherst, Duke, you've probably seen in the news in the last week. Faculty on these campuses have all um, uh, said no to contractual agreements with some of these companies. So we might think, okay, the MOOC fad is a fad and dying soon, or so we hope, but I think courseware is here to stay, which is not a pronouncement as it sounds, but I just think it's a kind of inevitability, or we're told it's an inevitability, which means it's going to be realized as such. And so the purpose of the talk is to move eventually to thinking about response um, in, in a way that would be more than just a refusal. I do think refusal has to be part of it, but I would hope to think about other ways in which we can negotiate or navigate the new pedagogic terrain that we're facing which is all by way of saying that the paper moves from dark to light. I've been moving or working a little bit with stru the structure of negative affirmative lately, and this talk has something of that aspect to it. Okay, from the rise of online universities, both for profit and free, and here's the framing image simply because it uses the title courseware from UC Irvine. The rise of online universities, both for profit and free, to the push to develop content modules branded with the name of established universities, it's clear that the 21st century university is fundamentally networked, nearly impossible to envisage without the objects and methodological practices of the computational sciences. 
profound shifts in delivery and distribution through courseware and open education initiatives have been commonly recognized, all the more so in the past year as MOOC has emerged as a mantra of neoliberal reform. Higher education is being Napsterized, we're told, and Thomas Friedman's cab driver is interested. <laughs> <laughs> From the announcing of the collaborative venture between the American Council on Education and Coursera in November 2012, which allows some online courses to be certified for transfer credit, to the push in the California legislature to mandate such eligibility, the conversation quickly seems to become a matter of when, not if. Pilots have, within a matter of months, become programs. After experimenting with a blended MIT course in circuits and electronics this term, San Jose State has announced that it will pay licensing fees for three to four additional edX courses in the fall and continue its partnership with the for-profit Udacity for lower division instruction in math, even again as we learned just yesterday that the philosophy department had refused the edX Harvard course in justice. Add to this Coursera's already <coughs> celebratory university partner count, 62 partners as of February, and plans by the British MOOC, Future Learn, to move into the Indian market this year, and we have a clear outline of the online learning bubble and the materialization of a two-tiered system, brick and click. Transformations in our socio-technological milieu have reconditioned the idea of the university into that of an educational enterprise that delivers content through big platforms on demand. Online education often seems to mean simply the posting of videos of lecture courses, but e-learning is not singular and encompasses teleconferencing, video conferencing, audio and video lectures, slides, text, email, interactive media, chat, listservs, course management systems, social networking, and yes, meetings in virtual environments such as Second Life, still. <laughs> if David Noble considered the battle against digital diploma mills and corporate for-profit driven education after the collapse of the tech bubble to be temporarily resolved in favor of the university as a modern idea, exuberance punctured, euphoria quelled, Twelve years on, that seems clearly no longer to be the case. Technocracy has arguably triumphed. University instruction is now openly regarded as a capital rather than operational expense, which means universities and private corporations partner to build platforms and modules with funding streams that once supported faculty research and instructional activities. Susan Guerlach, following a report on a UC Berkeley conference on university teaching as an e-business, notes that with digital courseware instruction shifts from being an off with digital courseware rather, instruction shifts from being an operational expense according to which faculty are paid for the time they devote to all aspects of teaching to being a capital expense, an investment in the production of courseware that becomes the intellectual property of the university. Such has been the successful administrative capture of knowledge production, evinced by patent deals, copyright disputes, pay-to-publish schemes, and corporate sponsorship of facilities and research processes alike. And here I think we might um, have in mind Philip Murawski's incisive analysis of the neoliberal corruption of scientific knowledge, an economy for which the American universities are now merely the cash cows. What's been well documented and often discussed is the neoliberal divestment in public institutions in favor of private interests and the disruptive effects of austerity politics. The University of California is a paradigmatic instance of this shift. First sees the opportunity afforded by a systemic financial crisis to dramatically scale back on funding commitments, necessitating furloughs, firing departmental closures, and all manner of disruptive restructuring in the name of efficiency and then offer private enterprise in the form of for-profit online education providers as the solution to the enrollment problem that inevitably results from the reduction of instructional staff. But I think the U.S. Post Office is another instructive example so that we can think of this issue systemically. With the USPS, first mandate absurd preliminary funding commitments that suddenly result in a $24 billion deficit, 
and then confidently suggest that the free market is determined that postal services ought to be privatized, that they have no, that they have to be reformed to be made adaptable to the reality of market conditions. In other words, that they have to adapt or die. The case for disruptive innovation in higher education is in fact now a thriving cottage industry. Witness OSU President Gordon Gee's deployment of a crisis narrative in order to insist that universities are soon to be made obsolete by changing fashion and technological habit. The choice, it seems to me, is this, reinvention or extinction. If we think it cannot happen to us, we ought to recall the fate of the Swiss watchmakers. Fabulous craftsmen, certainly, but the world has moved on. Technologies have advanced, habits have shifted. If the professoriate in this analogy are the watchmakers, then the universities in another are the smokestacks, industrial graveyards, technological ruins. Another, uh, from another interview. To fail to innovate and upgrade is to cling to an automotive assembly line while the factory closes. To adhere to craft and tradition is to be mired in an antiquated past, and risk the loss of one's market position to the forces of creative destruction. Here from a passage from the Innovative University text, you have the automotive analogy again. A rhetorical analysis, I think, of the discourse on reforming the university would show that the examples are almost always drawn from industrial manufacture. The new networked universities are driven by the principle of disruptive innovation beginning with a corner of the market not necessarily prioritized by traditional institutions, tutoring and introductory level of instruction are the two best examples, and continually oriented toward a market takeover. The Enlightenment project of knowledge production wholly transformed as online study groups become online universities such as peer-to-peer -peer university, where you can learn anything with your peers. Slightly less critical attention has been paid to processes of disaggregation, to the reformulation of university education as piecework, as in the development of tutoring centers on the model of call centers, the outsourcing of ancillary instructional responsibilities. The habituation of English that begins with colonial linguistic policies and the notion that native populations should learn to speak and read as someone other than themselves that they, that, that they should be English in all but color, leads directly to these de facto call centers where the affective labor of instructional assistance is conducted without threat of labor disruptions. From the bottom, as long as on demand was defined as a high likelihood of being served within a few minutes, economies of scale and cheap foreign labor could be combined to drive per student service cost unheard of lows about a company named Smart Thinking, which outsources children, and among other things. The future of online education is, by 2020, all universities will be. In 10 years, every college freshman will. The contemporary university is without question embroiled in a complex speculative bubble. Its future is instrumentalized, bureaucratically contained by commissions issuing white vision statements, blueprints, white papers, brochures. X University 2030. Such promissory speculative practices anticipate and endeavor to enact what is to come. Educational life worlds that are subjects of and subjects to socioeconomic engineering. The whole suite of management techniques that are the mark of bureaucratic rationality. Outcomes are mobilized for purposes of fundraising, trademark developing, market capitalization. Outcomes guarantee results. They are prescribed futures articulated within the present. Demand for degrees, for innovation, for information by any means necessary is articulated as insatiable, basically unlimited, to quote Dean Edley from um, the UC system again. As California Governor Jerry Brown says of his search query, University Education Online, we don't have to wait until January or February or March. We can have it right now. 
The query, like the statement from the Commission on the Future, instantiating the world we live in, the greater the imagination of an institutional crisis, the stronger the desire to speculate so as to contain and manage it. In this context, courseware or e-learning platforms are all the more administra and administratively seductive. Their emphasis on delivery, promising instantaneous fulfillment of demands. Education becomes an engineering problem. How best to exactly reproduce a message in one point sent from another. How to design communication systems for which the content of messages is irrelevant or courseware platforms for the delivery of non-specified modules. This is the contemporary condition of knowledge foreseen by Jean-Francois Lyotard, knowledge designed to fit into the new channels and become operational. And knowledge as communicative activity is particularly amenable or available to monitoring and measuring, to performance evaluations of channel, system, transmitter, and receiver alike. HR departments surveil their employees, observing screen behavior and attention differentials to consider automation strategies and calculate the productivity of each worker. Just as the University of Phoenix's online learning system, which is based on predictive software used in commercial contexts, draws on data collection and behavioral assessment in order to adapt learning to students. So too, MOOCs. Co-founder Daphne Kohler says that Coursera has set up its system with intensive data collection and analysis in mind. Every variable in a course is tracked. When a student pauses a video or increases its playback speed, that choice is captured in the Coursera database. The same thing happens when a student answers a quiz question, revises an assignment, or comments in a forum. Every action, no matter how inconsequential it may seem, becomes grist for the statistical mill. And here, also, I can think of Sandra's presentation this morning. Every action is evidentiary, every gesture, every click. The ostensible purpose of such analytics is efficiency of instruction and work, how best to realize predetermined outcomes on time and with minimal costs. The disenfranchised students are mere statistical material, bodies from which data is extracted, their function to provide the metrics that will legitimate the restructuring of educational institu institutions as near automated enterprises. Operations so streamlined and unclogged by noise as to be able to deliver functional messages on demand. The good of which is the delivery itself, assessed according to the performativity criterion. Contrast the extraction of data with self-calculation and the whole of the quantified self-movement and the techniques and technologies that support it, the wholesale administration of life, labor, and affect. Competent subjects practice life hacking or algorithmic living, their behavior producing data and data conditioning their behavior. Quotidian life management tasks are outsourced to technological devices. Apps like Rescue Time, accounting for all activity at the computer, classifying programs and pages according to metrics of waste and leisure. Productivity apps also install a difference between creative and merely technical activity. One needs freedom from one in order better to perform the other. <laughs> a freedom from obligation that is also a freedom from obligation to others. It's not incidental that productivity apps should primarily prohibit access to social networks. This is care of the neoliberal self, relentlessly individualist, freelance rather than organizational. Quantifying the self substitutes for pedagogic guidance, for expert tutoring, for instructional or institutional training. Courseware presumes algorithmic li living self-assessment to determine what needs to be improved, how to be a better worker, how to be a better student, and occasionally how to be a better person, with humanities courses offering enrichment and entertainment. The student developing her My Courses dashboard is not guided by a department, by a discipline, or by a counselor. 
She's in charge of her own education and able to sample and select at random if she so chooses. This is DIY U. Unlike health and fitness apps such as Fitbit, there are not discussion boards where one records goals and progress, exchanges advice and encouraging words, or makes oneself available to the scrutiny of others, friends, contacts, mentors who will record an absence or a lapse in activity. The severing of the individual and the social in part accounts for the alarmingly high rates of courseware attrition. Only debt collectors and admissions counselors working on commission can be relied upon to track enrollment. With the aid of assessment tools, students are instead to identify their own deficits and take steps to correct them on their own, through habit or perhaps with the aid of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> the imperative to, to align one's desires with the political affective economy to link life to work requires a certain submission, an adaptation to a given structure, a care of the self within an institutional imaginary that is perhaps expected, but not always eagerly or easily embraced. <coughs> when continuous self-monitoring is not sufficient to incentivize performance, gamification techniques can substitute, encouraging compliance then through both fear and fun, and proffering fantasies of rule-breaking. Who, after all, would not want to claim the mantle of edupunk, a high-tech do-it-yourself educator who skirts traditional structures? <coughs> the modular forms of courseware, of education as dashboard, are discrete and iterable. One can customize, sample, and create something like playlists a bit of AI, the history of ancient Rome, modern poetry, introductory physics, from different providers and different universities, lumped together as links for autodidacts and degree-hungry students alike. What one cannot necessarily learn on one's own, however, is the archaeological formation of disciplines, or, if one prefers, schools of thought, modes of inquiry. For all the work of establishing distinctive classificatory schema for the different platforms, courseware cannot yet, or has not yet, reproduced a relationship to discipline, field, and academic community. Disciplinary knowledge on a MOOC gateway page is interface design that simply, simply replicates and name the modern faculties, arts and sciences, that in the contemporary university have long been complicated particularly now as advocacy campaigns for the humanities work to re-articulate our mission. And I should say, in within the humanities, which is partly why this will have a bit of that emphasis. Menu options for the humanities, then, bear no relation to knowledge production. They're navigational aids rather than markers of institutional placement. The apex of modularity is a company like Straighter Line which sells the students to the ability to assemble credits for multiple online for-profit providers, bypassing the accreditation process by foregoing degrees in favor of a flexible monthly subscription plan, courses instead of cable on demand. <laughs> there is then no courseware ecology. Neither is there tradition in the sense of a linear timeline manifest in historical archives, intellectual debates, research discovery, or even institutional memory. With modular lesson units, knowledge becomes encoded into specific repeatable forms, in other words, grammaticized, which for Bernard Spiegler means that it's been rendered industrial, ooh, sorry, I thought I put Bernard Spiegler's quote up there, quote, industrially grammaticized, Industrially discretable, discrete, discretizable, reproducible, standardizable, calculable, and controllable by automata. For Stiegler, what is ultimately grammaticized through processes of social engineering is the social relationship itself. In plainer terms, in corporate terms, to grammaticize is also to eudacify. 
As San Jose State's developmental math coordinator recently remarked at the pilot four credit audacity course in basic math, we gave them lecture notes in a textbook and they udacified things and wrote the script, which we edited. In this sense, courseware, like IT, is essentially a service. So this is the meaning of the sort of subtitle I had at the outset, C-A-A-S, following from IT as a service. IT as a service, the basis of cloud computing, means that an outside company, often Amazon's EC2 or Microsoft's Azure, manage the infrastructure and storage, possibly also platforms, operating systems, web servers, and databases, and application software. Contemporary DOXA holds that infrastructure comes with practical and financial burdens. Operational expenses increase with each new piece of computing and the personnel required to maintain it. If networking, storage, and computing are instead automated, if they're virtualized, if infrastructure and platforms are managed by cloud providers, then redundancy is eliminated and companies are not left with legacy hardware as doorstops and coffee tables. If knowledge management systems are held in the cloud, then current versions of business processes, how-to documents, SOPs, can all be accessed and revised from any terminal. Companies can also importantly spend less on human resources, on healthcare and pension plans. IT as a service thus makes it possible for businesses to free up resources for innovation and experimentation, to become more agile and achieve operability more quickly. Udacity, Coursera, and others like it provide exactly these services. The labor, the hosting, the platforms, the applications for payment, testing, and identity verification, discussion boards or other community forums, and interface design. To udacify a math course is to maintain and support the physical resources, to produce and deliver them to scale, to provide the modular structure for content, to turn information and knowledge, lecture notes and textbooks, into a script that can then be customized for each university. An introductory mathematics course in every university, every, communi every community college, is, we are told, redundant. Why reinvent the wheel? Why invest in faculty who will tailor what is, after all, best standardized, particularly when the service provider holds the credentials of MIT or Amazon? Would it not be better, the thinking goes, to redirect scant resources to the top tier, to senior seminars, to all curricular matters that distinguish one department and one school from the next? <coughs> Courseware providers could be imagined in terms somewhat akin to Joseph Esposito's processed book as nodes on a network, except that they're not truly open, certainly not massively so. Firewalls, password protection, network security are all in place to preserve in the interest of preserving an individual brand. The multi-university enrollment in the nonprofit edX aside, Courseware providers could operate on the consortium model, but they do not, instead of functioning according to a logic of accumulation, individually acquiring content, reputations, and affiliations. Nor do they link to extant resources, to archives, to libraries, to repositories, such as the University of California's e-scholarship database, or even um, papers on academia edu, in the way that they might. In this sense, they're arguably first and foremost devoted to their own products and their own capital fortunes, rather than the fostering of a learning ecology, proselytizing statements about democratic education and access notwithstanding. The question universities rely upon in order to build their reputation in the humanities is, who is there? Insofar as courseware suggests a certain shift away from the university as a particular space or ground, away from there, the situated aspect of reputation might seem to be under threat. But from an administrative perspective, 
It can be recouped by the figure of the lecturer of celebrity, Khan Academy, and by the careful tending of a select few faculty whose research and charismatic aura confer upon an institution a certain distinction. Hence are faculty overwhelmingly encouraged to be entrepreneurs, to develop an educational product that then can be marketed under the logo of the university through sponsorship or affiliate arrangements with private companies. If, if it had been appropriate, I would have brought some of the emails that we received from administrators in UC, but also that I received at NYU this year, exhorting faculty to think about ways to innovate. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> Accepting courseware as a service also means accepting terms of use, accepting standards, accepting requests for comments, comments solicited in the form of user response, faculty input generated by a committee as a report that's simply filed away on a server dedicated for staff use or maybe in a cabinet drawer. Impassioned and committed editorials, blog posts, open letters, and symposia on the subject of MOOCs have critiqued the commodification of knowledge the privatization of public institutions, the increasing adjunctification of an already precarious labor force, the depreciation of expert knowledge, and the imminent collapse of the modern university project as it is mutated from the University of Culture to the University of Excellence to the University of Accumulation. As Brian Holmes puts it, quote, the university is now envisioned as a largely automated service provider for the human capital needs of corporations. Maybe during Q&A you can tell me about the MOOC event that was here a couple of weeks ago. What is notable about almost all of the critical evaluations of MOOCs is the common articulation of co-presence, the immediacy of the live encounter between teacher and student as the Maginot line in the battle over the futures of both K-12 and higher education. Yesterday, again, the San Jose State philosophy faculty wrote of their refusal to accept the edX course, quote, we believe that having a scholar teach and engage with his or her own students is far superior to having those students watch a video of another scholar engaging his or her students. <laughs> the emphasis on video suggesting the depersonalization and the inauthenticity of the communicative of the pedagogic exchange. Co-presence is without question an educative value worth defending, but our current students know well how to become accessible, how to become available and subject to others in online communities. And making the case for privileged forms of intimacy relies on distinctions between physical and virtual or embodied and disembodied that a decade of scholarship has taught us are untenable. Instead, I think academia needs to marshal the full critical philosophical and rhetorical resources at its disposal in order to think critically about interface design, about the scripts that structure ideas that in fact give them form and meaning. Understanding the problem of courseware in terms of courseware as a service would situate us within the very administrative paradigm from which we might begin to imagine alternative futures for e-learning platforms and techniques. If we situate it within its socio-technological milieu, that is, and start to think of it as part of the turn toward cloud computing, we might have a clearer sense of its limitations and even its possibilities. And here I have to stress that I'm not interested in spinning a techno-utopian narrative but I do think we should take the opportunity to articulate the intervention that we might make in terms of critical thinking, historical consciousness, and again, design into the conversation about e-teaching. So what I'm interested in sort of finding or articulating together is a response that would be more than a refusal, but that would include refusal. <laughs> <laughs> Contextual refusal. <laughs> In sum, universities and the people that run them need to be more rigorous and creative in their approach to infrastructure, not in the sense of boutique campus facilities and not in the sense of the strictly, not strictly in the sense of the technical systems that distribute and support e-learning. In other words, not simply networks or mobile platforms. 
Rather, we should think of infrastructure in terms akin to Nigel Thrift on the technological unconscious. Our, quote, minimal, con minimal conscious perception, which is held in place by all manner of systems and environments that extend awareness. The technological unconscious has an anticipatory structure. The ordinary state of things functions as such because it manifests on a regular basis. We expect it to be a certain way, and it is. Central to the operation of the technological unconscious is repetition, habits, or templates of position and juxtaposition. Repetition and routinization ensure intelligibility which in turn facilitates compliance, the body falling into a groove, into its place. The content of the technological unconscious, then, is the bending of bodies with environments to a specific set of addresses without the benefit of any cognitive input, inputs, a pre-personal substrate of guaranteed correlations, assured encounters, and therefore unconsidered anticipations. And here I think we might uh, have in mind post-industrial ideologies of flexibility and adaptation, the bending of bodies in relation to their environments, the structuring of life by technical systems. To extrapolate, the programmed outcomes of e-learning or courseware necessitate the production of a technological unconscious. The student at her dashboard is prepared for a certain experience, a type of encounter. The navigational menus, completion timelines, charts, schedules, all coordinate the activities of body and mind. They are organizational templates that instantiate habits and practices. And educational institutions, in my view, ought not to be so readily adapting these templates or scripts designed by non-academic companies, even those with research professors as CEOs. We recognize the syllabus as an apparatus that structures thought, that mandates and produces a set of intellectual rhythms, but we're only starting to understand our neurological and affective adaptations to screen environments, and in this moment of uncertainty, it seems particularly unwise to outsource interface design the design of the encounter between minds to developers that likely do not share our investments in the production and transmission of knowledge with a capital K. We need then to develop knowledges of form with respect to the interface. Form understood, as in Lauren de Lamp's terms, as that which, quote, has no ontology, but which is generated by repetitions that subjects learn to read as organized inevitability." End quote. Form has no interpretive content. It's made intelligible by repetition. The menu options, tables, banners, dialogue boxes, embedded videos on the interface, these are the grounds on which habits and practices take shape. And educators need to be thinking at that level about the organization of bodily and cognitive activities of their students, our students. Much has been written of the representational limitations of print with respect to our complex informational ecology. Jeff Bowker, for example, has suggested that we reimagine our knowledge-bearing objects and devise platforms, archives, and databases that are adequate to the multiple temporalities and multiple scales of knowledge in the present. By extension, we can certainly reimagine the presentation of content such that it clearly structures and communicates what, what, we, what is already known, but also allows for a play with that structure. We can also certainly reimagine the presentation of that which is only partially known, so as to facilitate collaborative knowledge production not the outsourcing of technical labor of NASA click workers to support the research of a particular team, but a genuine mutuality among researchers and students. We have some startup visions of such an exchange. Peer-to-peer -peer university was developed by the former executive of Creative Commons, executive director of Creative Commons. And MOOC platforms do promise, do promise sociability. 
But these communities of affect, provided they even emerge, and much anecdotal evidence suggests that they do not, are circumscribed by communicative protocols that have not yet been, been manipulated by motivated volunteers who are themselves likely committed to already well-established forums for horizontal trust relationships. No one wants to make another profile. <laughs> Education providers, along with libraries and other cultural institutions, may no longer be the point of public access to knowledge bases. That function has been ceded to the search query. But contra Governor Brown and others, that access, having it all right now at our fingerprints, is by no means sufficient. Students need to learn how to navigate and filter, to absorb rather than cut and paste, to allow for serendipitous discovery rather than prescribed results. In other words, they need to learn how to learn. None of this is controversial. Perhaps more strange will be my suggestion that negotiating courseware as a reform movement and as an ideology may also require us to work within the idea of education as a calculus <laughs> and devise metrics that evaluate student-teacher performance in terms that are, if not accurate, at least inhabitable, terms we can live with. What we need are reflexive, thick measurements not the ironic cynicism one has to adopt when fulfilling the requirements of accreditation agency, agencies, but a reflexivity born of a cognizance of the complex history of administrative and accounting techniques. What such measurements would introduce would be questions about value itself, how it's produced, its normative functions, its entanglement of the symbolic and the economic, and its sociocultural specificities. The idea of the university, after all, and I'll leave it here, is predicated on the notion that one comes to learn oneself only in community with others. Thank you. So maybe someone can tell me about the MOOC event that was here.
you have a question, and I think what Greg said, you're uh, oh, okay. sort of talking very much of a piece of what we all came up with, because we're all aware that there's no dispute in corporate elite technology in the book. But I think the rest of it, there probably isn't. Yeah. Um, in the sense that, they why would we want to? But what's interesting about your argument is that you could actually have made the same argument and taken all the technology out of it. In other words, the problems that you're describing with <coughs> courseware and digitalization are problems that have been underway in the university in terms of uh, shifting from a kind of, well, shifting to certain kinds of standardized assessment, yeah. for example, shifting yeah. governance to, you know, <coughs> No, absolutely. And in the article version, it would, it, I would absolutely deal with these things, um, with the accreditation process more generally. Uh, David Noble's Digital Diploma Mills, the three-part essay that, that um, I referred to just in passing, um, does a bit more genealogical work and thinks about the turn toward um, what he calls the digital diploma mill in terms of the history of the corporatization of education. So yes, his, his well, because of the moment in which it's written too, it's less embedded in the, in the question of um, uh, reform or, or disruptive innovation because that discourse is not yet developed in the management context. Um, and it's less concerned with the technological aspects of things. Um, so for him, it's, it's primarily about corporatization. And yes, loss of autonomy, IP issues. He's writing right after UCLA mandates that its faculty put its syllabi and so forth online. So it's a huge conversation and there's no way, it's hard to think about, or it was hard to think about ways in which to stage it that encompasses all of the issues. So the question is whether some kind of embrace of technology or courseware could serve as a wedge to, or to come to that in development so that that have proceeded. Yes, I mean, I do think, it, it was maybe covert, but I'm arguing for a kind of preemptive use of, of instructional technologies. In the fall, I'm doing an introductory course, so going right to that level in, in literary studies. And I'm going to make videos for the students. I have to do 200 lectures, 200 students, and then insist that they be there. And I'm not going to sort of perform a flip classroom idea as much, but I am going to create little videos on the side. But I'm also going to give them assignments like going to Open oh, Yale yeah. and some of the other courseware uh, or open education sites and view some of the videos on the same topic if I can find them and ask them then to make um, evaluative statements and to think about the relationship among these things. In other words, to, to get them to think a little bit more about search and filter and evaluation. If I can build that part in as an assignment rather than as because it's going to be there as cliff notes for them as a as a kind of approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your awesome talk. Um, I uh, Mackenzie brought up this really good point in the last panel about why it is that we continue to refer to neoliberalism as the thing that is that creating that that's, that's structuring these problems um, and. It, yeah, it makes me think, I wonder if you looked at Rod Ferguson's new book, Another Reorder of Things, which talks about the, the ways that interdisciplinary departments like women's studies and ethnic studies um, were not just a sort of a product of neoliberalism, but were a co-constitutive of neoliberalism. Um, and so I wonder um, if you agree or do you make that distinction as these things being um, not just a result of neoliberalism, but certainly like a result of development and creating neoliberalism, or if instead, as you were suggesting, maybe we would have something else after the worst thing that I certainly agree that neoliberals become a kind of catch all label, and it's meant to hold all of the responsibility for what has gone wrong or what we might feel has gone wrong. I don't know the particular text that you're engaging, but the whole literature on the disruptive university, in particular the innovative university, you couldn't but call, you couldn't call it anything but the neoliberal. It's coming right out of Hayek, right out of Milton Friedman. We do not invest in public systems or public institutions of any sort. Everyone ought to be left to her own devices. 
there's no such thing as society, etc. So it's absolutely informed by um, what uh, an, econom an, an economist would call neoliberal doc doctrine. But you're right, there's a way in which that, that substitutes for, for thinking sometimes, and it becomes a way of sort of dismissing out of hand uh, particular arguments or, or ideas. So I, I have to d use an anecdote, and I'm sorry, it's like my, my Thomas Friedman moment, but when I was on the bus on the way over here, it's actually in all sincerity, but the, the woman driving the bus was having an in-depth conversation with her friend, and they were talking about their final schedule, and one of them has an online course as part of her um, uh, slate, and it, they were, she was utterly matter-of-fact about it, first of all, which is always sort of striking. Um, but, the, but the friend was complaining about her final schedule compacted in a single day, and the other friend, the bus driver made the case that, oh, it's all, I can choose my own final time, I can do it when I like, etc. So it was absolutely the, the argument in favor of um, ease of use, that we are all conditioned to sort of accept certain systems because they're, it makes life easier and better for us. Yeah. Um, that doesn't illustrate anything in particular other than the fact that it's so seamlessly integrated now, it seems to me, in student life that the strangeness is experienced by faculty, or maybe I'll just put myself now here, in a certain generation where we don't, you know, all of a sudden it's happened and we went to sleep and woke up, you know, and all of a sudden there's a course card. Um, which is partly why I think that's why I think it's easy to make the argument not about inevitability exactly, but it's just, it's here already. So the student experience of it must be different to depend on the institution, the desires of the student, the type of education they want to pursue. I have a very smart student this term at NYU who's um, kind of dabbling in these different platforms for enrichment. And she'll talk about it in those terms. It's fun for her to go and learn about introductory physics. Um, she's not going to take any courses, she's just playing around, watching videos. It's a consumptive model, but it's also, you know, it's a sort of self-help model um, that one would have to regard with a certain kind of admiration. That she's interested and in looking for ways to, to satisfy that interest. And that is the best place to go if you don't want to go to Wikipedia and read on your own. You can at least get the sense that someone's speaking to you. I've, I've myself now spent a lot of time watching these lectures and playing around. And of course, the experience is hugely, it's tremendously different depending on where you are and who's talking even within a platform within a university. But some of them are kind of satisfying. I mean, it, you can't but think that the students might enjoy the experience at some level as part of a bigger uh, educative enterprise. So there's no one way of talking about student experience. I think one would have to do ethnographic research and do an institutional, institutional specific case set of case studies, I think, to think about a regional public university and a private and so forth in order to draw any kind of overarching conclusions about. But I can happily toss around the first person possessive for we and as educators and academics. I know that there's there's flaws in that as well. Is it there's a uniform way of thinking about it? I know there's not. <laughs> In, in this sort of modularity sort of argument, I had, a, I, had a, um, I had actually a argument slash conversation with one of my students um, just this past week. He, he, he basically made the, uh, made, made the economic argument of saying, I want to be a game level designer. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a son of a dean of the University of Chicago who's, you know, mm -hmm. I said, you know, he says, 
I don't want I you know I don't want to come out of school and with forty thousand dollars worth of debt, you know, without you know having to pay things that I don't specifically need to have for game design. And I just said, and I said, well, since all these things I'm target, I mean, are you sure you're the things that you, you think that you would know that you're going to have to have hard back and things that you're going to need to get out? And this is sure about that. But also on the other hand, it's, and I said, I, I really sat down with him and I said, you know something? You know what, you're, you're absolutely right. I said, if you are interested in a credential, then the degree is the way to go. But if you are so completely and absolutely sure that your vocation is not stupid and you think that, you know, you are so, that, that you can get by on skills and think that uh, you can have a that is not going to be looking for Instagram, you know, such, looking for a credential. And that's what they, in your, in your, you know, in your ascension or your career. And I said, you know something? Yeah. Do it. You know, and um, he and I are having a very rich, very, very rich conversation, but the thing is, is I just sort of, it's, it's, it's along the lines of the idea of media selection, that's sort of like saying, you know what, I only, you know, I can go on the internet and watch only the parts of the world that I want to see, and that sort of thing, and, and I said, what if you're wrong? You know, what if you're wrong? And he just, he just kind of said, I hadn't thought about that. If, yeah, no, absolutely. Can we push that a little, one step further, if I may, piggyback on Patrick's good question, or point, which leads to the question. Um, the one thing you didn't mention, obviously where different universities are positioned relative to this, which you mentioned, is enormously different. And um, I would say if you're looking, if you're talking about institution-specific research, you would also need to look at the, at the different ways in which the individuals involved cognitively process information yeah. still the individual level as well. Pet mm -hmm. Eve are those people who think that listening and reading and thinking is not active learning. Well, actually, if you're doing that, you are actively learning. Mm -hmm. But um, the one thing, Steph, you didn't mention are the employers who are saying, we want the students who get the best grades in these three classes, period, end of day, their jobs, send us their betas, and the students can register so that their their course uh, their grades are sent not sent to be the sent to grades. Mm -hmm. So they are actually it's one step further than Patrick's student, uh, the ones who know that if they just take these two classes they have a job. Mm -hmm. And frankly, for UWM students, if you've got you know the children of the of the brewers and the leather mongers and all of that, a lot of those people really that is the life they want. And we are serving them if we facilitate that. If I may make an extreme statement for those students. I'm saying this uh, in large part as a devil's advocate, but I think that point has to be mm -hmm. out there. So if it could be fun for the pair, those are two different kinds of students. Sure, absolutely. I mean, probably many in this room have been in planning group or working group after another about the future of use of instructional technologies on campuses and so forth. And inevitably you turn to sort of imagine different institutional or, or systemic arrangements. And my idea, it's, you know, it's just that, is that if, if we shorten high, I mean, if you might as well think at this level, if you shorten high school to three years and you have a three year sort of exploratory community, community college period where students can think about whether they seriously want to do vocational training or they, they um, can take a more instrumentalist targeted approach to their education. Take care of your labor problem, first of all, because all of the unemployed PhDs all of a sudden have a new sort of purpose with the freed up year. I mean, I mean this is all sincerity. The last year of high school is recognized to be useless anyway. Um, which is all by way of saying, I think if we need to think, if we're going to address the problem, of course, where I think we have to think more broadly about institutions and degree structures in the country and not are advocating for a new Bologna process by any means, but a few conversations at that level about the about vocational versus um, liberal arts training versus research training might be useful. But then why not just the little techno-utopians? Because you actually do it in margins, even though you pay for strain, we all now have to make what we don't do it. Yeah. Why not? We used to own that to be very well. Yeah. And of course one doesn't do it by evil or playing certain narratives and so on. But, but why not reclaim the utopian potential? 
I'm going to do it in practice. That's why I didn't put it in the description of paper, but that's what I'm going to do in the fall with my class. Yeah. And maybe then I would write up the experience and it would become theory or analysis, but it seems best to sort of think about it practically in a hands-on way first, and then that would authorize any kind of visionary token statements that I want to make. Really, it's important, I think, to piggyback on this, that in these discussions, we distinguish <coughs> between instructional uses of digital technology and coursework. Uh, Prepackaged courseware was built by individuals who are either not employees of the university or tangential to the university, not credentialed by the university, and has come with severe restrictions on their use by those at the university. I think we have to have that discourse as you presented it on courseware. And we have a, a, a rich discussion about what courseware is. Yeah. Um, and to keep that separate to some extent, from what all of us, or well, many of us, are doing in terms of innovative use of digital technology and pedagogy. Right. Um, one of the flip sides of the critique of uh, coursework's use of lecturing is, of course, pointing out that the university's traditional reliance on large lecture course delivery uh, is still one of our greatest mm -hmm. points. And that our students increasingly cannot learn in those settings. And that project-based learning has got to be adopted and increased <coughs> more by faculty. I'm, I'm right now reading the end of semester projects for my senior seminar in the draft version. Many of them are multimedia projects. And I'm combining the form of composition with the research, that's the research requirement. sociality in these platforms, which is why I think making a case for sociality is the, the one thing that we can offer in a brick and mortar university is, is wrong-headed, because that can quickly just be taken over or supplanted or, or um, translated into a different platform. But I put this slide up simply to say that the, I think the traditional courseware is fairly flexible. It's the meaning is not necessarily fixed in the UC system. It's, it's not outsourcing. It's our own content that we're packaging and delivering. The one term in the conversation that is fixed is MOOC, you know, I mean, and that's partly because it's an acronym, but uh, otherwise I don't think we've yet stabilized the, the language. E-learning is where that's term, I think that suffices as well. Courseware.com is actually a title that I have had for an article since, in all honesty, 2000, um, when I was first a professor at the university and then I went to one of these, again, instructional uses of technology meetings. Um, and was presented with the idea of using software to teach writing, and they were talking about automation and the way that the conversations unfold in the last few months. And I came away thinking, I'm going to write an article called Courseware.com. So it's clearly, you know, late 90s, 2000 title in a sense, but, but the Courseware as a service as a subtitle, I think, speaks to the updating. Uh, uh, liberal arts faculty at Stanford, where it's 
harbor um, if the roof model continues to develop. So what is going to happen if I put it uh, in a bracket of essay of my own in Stanford's undatious arts and uh, sciences faculty um, can't, can't make it in this Who's going to do their labor so that they can do the work that they have to do? Right. No, no, I mean, uh, very good question. So it, I, my back of envelope sketch of you know, an idea really is more considered that I'm making out. It's just a tinkering of the master plan, actually, in the UC system. And it's, it's not making that dramatic of a change. So it doesn't impact graduate education at all. I mean, again, we're talking about my back of an, of an envelope sketch for this. Um, but K through 12 in, in California is, is not in a good state, and um, <laughs> it's especially not a good, in a good state in the humanities. No child left behind has been devastating, as it has for all states. Um, but why not imagine an extra year of college that would, you know, in, in a sense, just build on to what California students often do, which is go to San Jose State or Cal State Fullerton, and then go into the UC <coughs> system in their um, junior and senior year. So it doesn't actually change the, pic the labor picture at all. It just actually creates another market, if you think about it, because there's another year right. that so needs to be staff staffed by people with PhDs. Sure, but it can't be staffed by students who just have education degrees. But why are you know why are you or I in a privileged position not to have to be doing that sort of thing? I mean, you know, why? I mean, historical access to our year and tenure, right? Yeah. Which is the labor that you're talking about? Is it the MOOCs that you're getting the course no, no, from someone else? No, no, no. This, <coughs> that, this is going to open a new market for PhDs who are teaching people who are trying to figure out what they want to do. I mean, if it were me, no, I, no. I, 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 I shouldn't. I shouldn't pitch it as, as simply exploratory. I, what I'm thinking about is making community college more meaningful as a transitional experience. It's it's. I mean, one of the reasons it's not meaningful is that ca uh, teachers in the Cal State system have a 5-5 load. You cannot do very much in with the 5-5 load. So, yeah. So, I mean, the, the service, that will take off a course so you can do a 5-4 or 4-4 four, if four, you're doing a lot of service. So it, it's a completely degraded experience. So if you think about expanding the community college I can't believe we're talking at this level about my sort of fantastic idea, but. I <laughs> for <laughs> 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 a long time, I tried to find an argument that, you know, we are, we are part of the problem. You know, so the, the business of higher education is teaching them, you know, mm -hmm. um, And for good reasons, who would want to do that? Maybe. I don't. And I won't. I like teaching. I like teaching. I don't like teaching five and I don't like teaching people who don't know how to put a sentence together. Right, I can Yeah, yeah, it's just, sorry. You lose a year, and you I maybe start thinking about things like the public school, um, Ness Hall in Chicago, the Free University in London, mm -hmm. and even especially something like the public school, right, which is partially fake. It's partially an online platform. Mm -hmm. So, and, it's, and since you were talking about, you know, uh, wanting something that's more than just a refusal, maybe something like a constitutive alternative, yeah. and um, and even thinking about, you know, Brian Holmes' work, right, he has the idea of extra disciplinary critique, right, which is um, there's a particular type of intellectual and political work 
that can't be done within the university right now. And that's partially the stance as an independent scholar. But so I'm just wondering what you think about that. And if, if the, um, and even just like, you know, there's a larger term contemporary art right now, which is often referred to as the educational term. Um, if any of that is going to figure into uh, the way you're thinking about this, or, or just what, what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, absolutely. I find the idea of the autonomous university extremely compelling. And I, I think. In practice, it actually is meaningful for, for, you know, it's not just an idea, in other words. But I think it has a limited application that, that's part of it. So I would want to think of it as just part of a larger picture of reimagining the university or the work of the university, work of education more properly. But that said, I actually want to think about ways in which the institutions can be reformed, not reformed, preserved. I'm not so quick to want to just dismiss the institution out of hand. I do think it's an idea worth preserving. Um, so I, I guess I would want to think about the autonomous university as a supplement, not a substitute. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to, talk, uh, to thank for your talk because uh, in the last year I was engaged in Brazil, in the huge program of the government, especially in Brazil, where uh, e-learning is viewed as a way to, to confront a great majority of people that don't have access to university, mm -hmm. much more than in the US. Then uh, I first refused, as everybody that has uh, that, that works in the, for a long time in the university, this idea always seemed to me absurd. Then in the second moment, I, 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 I rethought and I proposed something to do the stuff. And I, then I discovered that uh, if you want to do something in this uh, domain, uh, you have to change the, the, this interface that is, that is between us and the e-learning e system. I mean, they have their way of selling the, the product, yeah. as, as we showed. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing is how to achieve a new model of, uh, of uh, <coughs> learning or teaching that the university can can bring as a difference. So I think uh, the point for me was not only putting, producing my own videos too, mm -hmm. uh, about what I was intending to, to, to teach, mm -hmm. but also uh, trying to teach how to use what is disposable <coughs> in the web. So there is a lot of things in the web. Mm -hmm. The thing is, if you want to teach uh, these people that it, Is this something we should be worried about, etc.? But 
her writing and her statement of purpose and you know test scores and so forth all made the case on their own. So I don't think that they're simply going to be ghettoized or you know confined to this horrible future fate. By no means do I think we all ought to be you know encouraging students to get for-profit degrees. I just mean that I think they're a little more integrated into the economic fabric than we might think. Yeah. Well, I really love your reform and refusal idea. I think that's a positive and important I think it was the LRB that were somewhere that I read in a big article recently on the class divide. Would you not mention that I'm sure it's part of this problem, uh, project between classified in that the upper class elite institutions or students will receive the hands on education and everyone else will be online in MOOCs. And what you're proposing is that we Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's not um, accidental that it would be Amherst and Duke that would so flatly refuse because that's how liberal arts institutions are going to preserve their, basically their tuition costs, right? That they, you can, you're not going to be able to sell students on a $52,000 degree if it's partly in line. Why don't we all get some drinks right on your napkin, bring them back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.